of regeneration. By that same word in which the elect are called to communion with God and his Christ, they are also regenerated to a far more excellent life. For so James says in chapter 1, verse 18, Of his own will he begat us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. It is therefore proper we proceed from the subject of effectual calling to that of regeneration. Number two, but here all things are deep and wrapped up in mystery. Who can unfold to us the secrets of his own corporal birth? Now, after a principle of spiritual life is infused into the elect soul by regeneration, divine grace does not always proceed therein in the same method and order. It is possible that for some time the spirit of the life of Christ may lie, as it were, dormant in some, almost in the same manner as vegetative life in the seed of a plant, or sensitive life in the seed of an animal, or a poetical genius in one born a poet, so that no vital operations can yet proceed therefrom, though savingly united to Christ, the fountain of true life by the Spirit. This is the case with respect to elect and regenerate infants, who is the kingdom of God, and who therefore are reckoned among believers and saints, though unqualified through age, actually to believe and practice godliness. Moreover, the spirit of a new life will even sometimes exert itself in vital actions, and those who have received it in their infancy, as they gradually advance in years, and are qualified to raise their thoughts above the objects of sense. Accordingly, it has often been observed that in children of five or six years of age, some small sparks of piety and devotion have shone forth in holy longings, ardent little prayers, and in a certain extraordinary tenderness of conscience, not daring to do anything with respect to God, themselves, or their neighbors, which they have been taught to be displeasing to God, as also it appears in their discourses concerning God and Christ which have been full of a holy and unfeigned love and breathing, of a heavenly nature which I have not words to express. Thus sometimes God is pleased out of the mouths of babes and sucklings to ordain strength. Psalm 8, 2. This has been especially observed in some dying children to the great astonishment of all present. But when the foundation is laid, divine grace does not always grow up in the same manner. It often happens that this principle of spiritual life, which had discovered its activity in the most tender childhood, according to and sometimes above the age of the person, God in a singular grace, preceding the full maturity of the natural faculties, grows up by degrees with the person, after the example of our Lord, who increased in wisdom and stature, and in favor with God and man, Luke 2, verse 52 and of John the Baptist, who grew and waxed strong in spirit, Luke 1, verse 80. Such persons make continual progress in the way of sanctification, and grow insensibly unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, Ephesians 4, 13. We have an illustrious example of this in Timothy, who from a child had known the Holy Scriptures, Second Timothy 3, verse 15 and who in his tender youth to Paul's exceeding joy had given evident signs of an unfeigned faith, with tears of the most tender piety bursting out at times, Second Timothy 1, 4, and 5. On the other hand, sometimes these sparks of piety, especially which more sparingly show forth in childhood, when in a manner covered with the ashes of worldly vanities and carnal pleasures of youth, will appear to be almost extinguished. The allurements of the deceitful flesh and the sorceries of a tempting world, assaulting the unadvised unwary heart with its deceitful pleasures, almost stifle those small beginnings of piety, and for months, sometimes for years together, so violently overpower them that all their attempts against them seem to be in vain. Yet there are still in these persons remorses of conscience, awakening at times, languid resolutions and vanishing purposes of reform in their lives till by the infinite efficacy of divine grace insinuating into the languid and decaying breast they awake as from a deep sleep and with the greatest sorrow for their past life and utmost seriousness apply to the careful practice of piety 
the warmth of their zeal then breaks forth, being exceedingly desirous to show by brighter flames as having been unwillingly kept smothered under the ashes. Augustine has given us in his own person a representation of this state in the excellent book of his Confessions. But the elect are not all favored with regenerating grace in their infancy. There are some adult persons whom God regenerates and at once effectually calls and converts in the second act from a worldly and hypocritical condition or even from a state of profligate wickedness. Thus it is with those who are born and brought up without God's covenant or even of those who living where this covenant is dispensed have sold themselves wholly to sin, Satan, and the world. The regeneration of these is usually followed with great consternation of soul and sorrow for sin, with a dread of God's fiery indignation, and incredible desires after grace, together with an inexpressible joy upon finding salvation in Jesus, and a wonderful alacrity in the service of the Lord, which they can scarcely contain. All this may be observed in the jailer, of whom we read in Acts 16. On this depends the solution of that question, whether we are to look upon any as born again, but those who can specify the time, manner, and progress of their regeneration. None indeed are here to be flattered or soothed, as to think it lawful for them securely to presume on their regeneration. But then the consciences of believers are not to be racked with too severe a scrupulosity. We cannot determine this point without a distinction. We have just shown that the progress of regeneration is various. Adult persons who are brought altogether from a carnal to a spiritual life, indeed may, and ought exactly to know the beginning and manner of so great a change. They who, though regenerated in infancy, have yet been carried away by the entanglements of the world, and for some time have struggled, as it were, with destruction, but afterwards have been roused by the grace of God, made to renounce the world and give themselves wholly to piety, such as we described in section 17, may, and it is their duty to recollect, not so much the beginning of their very first regeneration as a process of that actual and thorough conversion. But it would be wrong to require those who, being regenerated in their infancy, have grown up all along with a quickening spirit to declare the time and manner of their passage from death to life. It is sufficient if they can comfort themselves and edify others with the fruits of regeneration and a constant tenor of a pious life. It is, however, the duty of all to recollect, not in a careless manner, the operations of the Spirit of grace on their hearts, which is highly useful, both for our glorifying God and for our own comfort and excitement to every duty. There cannot be the least doubt of God's being the author of our regeneration, for we become his sons by regeneration, being born of God, John 1, 12. And even in this respect, the sons of God by grace bear some resemblance to him, who is the son of God by nature, observing only the difference between the infinite excellency of our Lord and that dark resemblance of it in us. Why is the Lord Jesus called the son of God? Because begotten of the Father, Psalm 2, verse 7, wherein consists that generation of the Father, in this, that as the Father has life in himself, so he has given to the Son to have life in himself. John 5.26 And why are we, in communion with Christ, called the sons of God? Because his Father is our Father. John 20.17 How is he our Father? He has begotten us. James 1.18 1 John 5.4 and 11 Wherein does this generation consist? He has made us partakers of a divine nature. Second Peter 1.4 Thus we are even transformed into his likeness, and have upon us no contemptible effulgence of his most glorious holiness. Who can distinctly declare in what manner he was poured out like milk and curdled like cheese within the bowels of his mother? The prophet himself, as if he was seized with a holy amazement, cried out, I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows right well. My substance was not hid from you. When I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth, your eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. Psalm 139, verses 14 to 16. But if these things which regard the origin of our body, 
and the beginnings of this animal life are involved in such darkness as to frustrate the inquiries of the most sagacious. How much more involved are the things that constitute our spiritual regeneration, which none can doubt to be altogether mysterious. But yet this is so necessary that our Savior declares that without it there is no entering into the kingdom of heaven. John 3, verses 3 and 5. It therefore deserves to be inquired into that if we have perhaps attained to it, we may celebrate with becoming praises the glorious perfections of God our Father, which shine so conspicuously in this illustrious work. And properly valuing our happiness, we may frame the whole tenor of our lives in a manner suitable to it. We give this definition of it. Regeneration is that supernatural act of God in which a new and divine life is infused into the elect, spiritually dead, and that from the incorruptible seed of the word of God made fruitful by the infinite power of the Spirit. We are all dead in Adam, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 22, through the poison of the tempting serpent. This murderer from the beginning, John 8, 44, had such success attending his endeavors that all men who now exist are by nature dead in trespasses and sins, Ephesians 2, verse 1. That is first. They are separated at the greatest distance from God and his spirit, who is the soul of their soul and life of their life, or in the language of Paul, alienated from the life of God, Ephesians 4.18. Secondly, they are spiritually insensible of all spiritual things, destitute of all true feeling. They do not rightly consider the load of their sins because they are in them as in their element, nor have a right knowledge of their misery being past feeling, Ephesians 4.19 nor any relish for divine grace, because it has not yet been conferred upon them, nor any longing after heavenly things, being ignorant of their worth. Thirdly, they are wholly incapable of every act of true life, not sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 5. The understanding is overspread with dismal darkness. Ephesians 4:18 has not set God before it, Psalm 86, 14. Receives not the things of the Spirit of God, neither can it know them, 1 Corinthians 2, 14. The will has no tendency to things unknown, and thus all the things of God are despised by it as mean. And if at times it seem to perform any things that have some appearance of vital actions, this proceeds not from a principle of life, but resembles those automatical or artificial motions by which statues ingenuously frame counterfeit living animals. Number six. But as the dead carcass swarms with vermin arising from putrefaction, in which the brisket life is observed, though of another order and kind from that life which was formerly in that body. So in like manner there is a kind of life in a man spiritually dead, but it is carnal, hellish, and diabolical, at the greatest distance from true life, and the more vigorous it is, it gives the more evident signs of the most deplorable death. The apostle has elegantly joined this death and life, Ephesians 2, verses 1 and 2. When you were dead in trespasses and sins, you walked in them, as is the life of this world. The understanding, not apprehending the wisdom of God, looks upon it as foolishness. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 14. And yet when it would find wisdom in the things of God, it so transforms them by its mad presumption, and compels them, even against their nature, to a conformity to the notions of its trifling, presumptuous self-wisdom that while it impiously presumes to correct the wisdom of God, it transforms it in a dreadful manner into downright folly. The will, not finding anything in God wherewith it can take delight, seeks it either in the creatures without God, or which is more abominable, and the very perpetration of wickedness. The affections shaken off the reins of reason rush on in full career, the body with all its members is the throne of mad and furious lusts, 
and the whole man being so averse from God and infatuated with the fond love of himself, sets himself up for an idol, makes his own advantage his supreme end, his own pleasure his most infallible law. This is the life of the soul which is dead while living. 1 Timothy 5 verse 6 And thus it is with the elect before regeneration. But by regeneration a new life is put into them, resulting from a gracious union with God and the Spirit. For what the soul is to the body, that God is to the soul. Moreover, the spiritual life may be considered either by way of faculty, and in the first act, in the usual language of the schools, or by way of operation, and in the second act, in a former respect, it is that inward constitution of the soul in which it is fitted to exert those actions which are acceptable to God in Christ, by the power of the Spirit uniting it to God, whether such actions immediately flow from that principle, or whether they lie concealed for some time as fruits in their seed. In the latter respect, it is that activity of the living soul by which it acts agreeably to the command of God and the example of Christ. If we consider this first principle of life, there is not the least doubt, but regeneration is accomplished in a moment. For there is no delay in the transition from death to life. No person can be regenerated so long as he is in the state of spiritual death. But in the instant he begins to live, he is born again. Therefore, no intermediate state between the regenerate and unregenerate can be imagined so much as in thought if we mean regeneration in the first act. For one is either dead or alive, has either the spirit of the flesh in the world, or the spirit of God actuating him, is either in the state of grace or in the state of malediction, either the child of God or of the devil, either in the way to salvation or damnation. There neither is nor can be any medium here. The Holy Scripture divides all mankind into two classes, sheep and goats. Matthew 25, 2 and 3 And compares their goings to two ways in which the one which is broad leads to destruction, the other which is narrow to life. Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14 And there is no one who does not tread in one or other of these ways. And what if he whom some imagine to be in an intermediate state, should depart this animal life before he be fully brought to the spiritual life, would such a one be received into heaven. But heaven is open only to the actually regenerate, John 3.3. 3. Or would he be thrust into hell? But hell is allotted only for the goats and for those who, all their life long, have walked in the broad way. Or perhaps such will be received into some intermediate place, where being free from the pains of hell and deprived of the joys of heaven, they will delight themselves in I know not what degree of natural happiness, as some popish doctors discoursing in the Council of Trent, of infants dying without baptism, pleased themselves with these fond sportings of their imagination, which the author of the history of that council, in book, chapter 2, page 157, has not dismissed without a good deal of acrimony and sharpness. Or you will say, perhaps, it is a case which never happens that anyone should die in that intermediate state. But produce me the vouchers of such an assertion, in which security is given to those in this intermediate class, of retaining their lives till they shall have declared of what class they choose to be, I do not remember to have read anything on that head in Scripture. And if that intermediate state has such an indissolvable connection with salvation, it will be no longer intermediate, but a state of grace. For it is grace alone to which the attainment of glory is infallibly assigned. I admit there are various degrees of regeneration in the second act, and that the seed of it sometimes lies hid under the earth, or at most exert some slender and initial, and as it were, infantile operations, differing very much with respect to perfection from those which a more advanced spirit of sanctification produces, yet seeing the former also have their rise from the fountain of the new life, it is plain that they who exert them are to be ranked among the regenerate. 
For we must say one of these two things, either that these operations ascribed to the intermediate state proceed from the powers of nature and common grace, and thus there is nothing in them which may not be found in the reprobate, and those entirely unregenerate, or that they proceed from the indwelling spirit of grace, and so are effects of regeneration to which the beginnings of the new life are owing. So it appears, there are no preparations antecedent to the first beginning of regeneration, because previous to that, nothing but mere death in the highest degree is to be found in the person to be regenerated. When we were dead in sins, he has quickened us together with Christ, Ephesians 2, 5. And indeed, the Bible represents man's conversion by such similitudes as shows that all preparations are entirely excluded, sometimes calling it a new generation, to which certainly none can contribute anything of himself. But yet, as natural generation presupposes some dispositions in the manner, so that we may not imagine any such thing to be in ourselves but from God. We have this held forth by the similitude of a resurrection in which a body is restored from manner, prepared by no qualifications, yet because here certainly is matter. But in the resurrection of the soul there is nothing at all, therefore we have added the figure of a creation, Psalm 51.10, Ephesians 2.10, by which we are taught that a new creature exists from a spiritual nothing, which is sin, but as there was not something and nothing to assist and sustain creation, so there was nothing to oppose and resist. But sin is so far from submitting to what God does, that it is reluctant to it, and in a hostile manner at enmity with him accordingly. The other images did not fully complete the idea of this admirable action, till at length it is called the victory of God. Victory, I say, over the devil who maintains his palace. Luke 11, verse 21. And effectually worketh in the children of disobedience. Ephesians 2, 2. All these operations of God, which Alexander Moore has in an elegant order ranged after one another, De Victoria Grati, for Thessalonians 10, tend to exclude as far as possible all preparations from the beginning of our regeneration. The semi-Pelagians, therefore, of Marcells, were mistaken who insisted that a man comes to the grace in which we are regenerated in Christ by a natural faculty, as by asking, seeking, knocking, and that, in some at least, before they are born again, there is a kind of repentance going before, together with a sorrow for sin and a change of the life for the better, and a beginning of faith, and an initial love of God, and a desire of grace. It is true they did not look on these endeavors to be of such importance, so that it would be said, we were by these rendered worthy of the grace of the Holy Spirit, as Pelagius and Julian profess. But yet they imagined they were an occasion by which God was moved to bestow his grace. For they said that the mercy of God is such that he recompenses this very small beginning of good with this illustrious reward. The remonstrants are likewise mistaken when they say, Some work of man, therefore, goes before his vivification, namely to acknowledge and bewail his death, to will and desire deliverance from it, to hunger, thirst, and seek after life, all which in a great deal besides is required by Christ and those whom he will make alive. But there is little accuracy in the reasonings of these men for first since our nature has become, after having eaten of the forbidden fruit like an evil tree, it can produce no fruit truly good and acceptable to God, and do nothing by which it can prepare itself for the grace of regeneration, unless a person can be thought to prepare himself for grace by sin. Secondly, it has been found that they who in appearance were in the best manner disposed for regeneration were yet at the greatest distance from it, as the instance of that young man, Matthew 19, verses 21 and 22, very plainly shows. He appeared to be full of good intentions, and inflamed with a desire after heaven and a blameless life before men, to a degree that Jesus himself beholding him loved him. But notwithstanding all these dispositions, he parted with our Lord sorrowful. Thirdly, and on the other hand, they who had not even the least appearance of any preparation, as the publicans and harlots, went into the kingdom of God before those who were civilly righteous 
and externally religious. For these last believe not John declaring the way of righteousness, but the publicans and the harlots truly believed. Matthew 21, verses 31 and 32. Fourthly and lastly, God testifies that in the first approach of his grace, he has found of them that sought him not and asked not for him. We have not certainly received grace because we are willing, but grace is given us while we are still unwilling. There have been some, likewise, among ourselves who have spoken of preparations to regeneration or conversion, but in a quite different sense from the favorers of Pelagianism. In persons to be regenerated, they have assigned first a breaking of the natural obstinacy and a flexibility of the will. Secondly, a serious consideration of the law. Thirdly, a consideration of their own sins and offenses against God. Fourthly, a legal fear of punishment and a dread of hell. And consequently, a despairing of their salvation with respect to anything in themselves. For in this order, William Perkins, Cases of Conscience, reckons up these preparations, and William Ames in the same manner. And the British divines explain themselves almost to the same purpose in the Synod of Dortrecht, page 139 of the Utrecht edition, 1620, folio. First, there are some external works ordinarily required of men before they are brought to a state of regeneration or conversion, which are wont sometimes to be freely done, sometimes freely omitted by them as going to church, hearing the word preached, and the like. Secondly, there are some internal effects previous to conversion or regeneration excited by the power of the word and spirit in the hearts of those who are not yet justified as the knowledge of the will of God, sense of sin, dread of punishment, anxiety about deliverance, some hope of pardon. But they differ from the favors of Pelagianism in this manner first, that they are not for having these things to proceed from nature, but profess them to be the effects of the spirit of bondage, preparing a way to himself for their actual regeneration. Secondly, that they are not for God's bestowing the grace of regeneration from a regard to, and moved by occasion of, these preparations, much less by any merit in them. But they imagine that God in this manner levels a way for himself, fills up valleys, depresses mountains and hills, in order the better to smooth the way for his entrance into that soul. No, the British divines add that even the elect themselves never behave in these acts preceding regeneration in such a manner as that on account of their negligence and resistance they may not justly be abandoned and forsaken of God. Yet they call them rather preparation for grace than the fruits and effects of grace, because they think that even the reprobate may go as far as this, and they affirm that these antecedent effects produced by the power of the word and spirit in the minds of men may be, and in many usually are stifled and entirely extinguished through the fault of the rebellious will. But we really think they argue more accurately who make these and the like things in the elect to be preparations to the further and more perfect operations of a more noble and plentiful spirit, and so not preparations for regeneration, but the fruits and effects of the first regeneration, for as these things suppose some life of the soul which spiritually attends to spiritual things, and are operations of the Spirit of God when going about to sanctify the elect, we cannot but refer them to the Spirit of grace and regeneration. Nor is it any objection that the like or the same may be also said to be in reprobates, for they are only the same materially, but not formally. Reprobates also have some knowledge of Christ, some taste of the grace of God, and of the powers of the world to come. Yet it does not follow that the knowledge of Christ as it is in believers, and that relish of grace and glory they have is not the gift of the spirit of grace and of glory. And indeed the things mentioned by Perkins and the other British divines are no preparations for regeneration in the reprobate, either from the nature of the thing or the intention of God. Not the former, for however great these things may appear to be, yet they are consistent with spiritual death, and a reprobate are so far from being disposed by it to a spiritual life, that on the contrary, deceived by those actings which counterfeit spiritual life, they are the more hardened in a real death, and fondly pleasing themselves, or at a greater distance from inquiring after true life, which they falsely imagine they have obtained. Not the latter, for no intention of God can be rendered void. 
It is therefore necessary that all these things be in another manner in the elect than in the reprobate. If this matter be more closely considered, we shall find that the orthodox differ more in words and in a manner of explaining than in sense and reality. For the term regeneration is of ambiguous signification. Sometimes it is blended with sanctification. And by regeneration is understood that action of God in which man, who has now become the friend of God and endowed with spiritual life, acts in a righteous and holy manner from infused habits. And then it is certain there are some effects of the spirit by which he usually prepares him for the actings of complete faith and holiness, for a knowledge of divine truth, a sense of misery, sorrow for sin, hope of pardon, and so on, go before anyone can fiducially lay hold on Christ and apply himself to the practice of true godliness. God does not usually sanctify a man all at once before ever he has had any thought about himself and God and any concern about his salvation. And this is what the British divines seem to have intended when in Confirmationae Second Day Theosius, they thus speak, divine grace does not usually bring men into a state of justification in which we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ by a sudden enthusiasm, but first subdues and prepares them by many previous acts of the ministry of the word, by which words they sufficiently show that by regeneration they mean the state of passive justification. But sometimes regeneration denotes the first translation of a man from a state of death, to a state of spiritual life, in which sense we take it. And in that respect, none of the orthodox, if he will speak consistently with his own principles, can suppose preparatory works to the grace of regeneration. For either he would maintain that these works proceeded from nature, and so by the confession of all the orthodox are but dead works and splendid sins. But none in his right mind will affirm that any can be disposed for the grace of regeneration by those things which are sinful or he would maintain that these works proceeded from the Spirit of God. But if thus far he does not operate in another manner in the elect and in the reprobate, these works, notwithstanding this his operation, may be reckoned among dead works. For the orthodox look upon all the actions of the reprobate to be sinful, let them be ever so much elevated by divine assistance. So the British divines, quote, an evil tree which naturally brings forth evil fruit must itself be first changed to a good tree before it ever can yield any good fruit. But the will of an unregenerate person is not only an evil but also a dead tree. I now infer the reprobate are never regenerated and therefore continue evil trees without ever producing any other than bad fruit. And so there can be no preparation in such works for regeneration for the reason above explained. If you say that these works which you call preparatory are different in the elect, I ask in what respect? No other answer can be given but this, that they proceed from the spirit of grace and life. Right, but then they are not preparations for their first regeneration, but effects of it. For regeneration is the first approach of the spirit of grace and life, effectually working in the elect. You will say then, are there no preparatory dispositions to the first regeneration? I confidently answer, there are none. With respect to the birth of a child, the work of God is previous to any will of the person that comes into the world, so also in the spiritual birth in which we begin to put off the old man. I own a deed spiritual death has its degrees, but with a distinction, what is primitive therein, or what is destitute of, namely the want of the life of God, is equal or alike in all, and in this respect there are no degrees less or more. But what is possible, or as it were positive therein, namely those evil habits, these indeed are very unequal. In infants there are only those evil habits which come into the world with them. In the adult there are others, contracted and deeply rooted by many vicious acts and a course of wickedness. These again greatly differ according as by the secret disposition of God's providence. The affections of men are more or less restrained. For though every kind of wickedness like a certain hydra lurks in the heart of all, yet God allows some to give loose reins to their vices and to be hurried on as by so many furies while he moves others with a sense of shame and a reverence for the laws, and some kind of love to honor and honesty, who in that respect may be said not to be at such a distance from sanctifying grace as those who are guilty of horrid crimes, which are more opposite thereto than a civil and external honesty of life. 
But yet, whatever length any before regeneration has advanced in that honesty, he nevertheless remains in the confines of death in which there is no preparation for life. Nor do we agree with those who so inconsiderately assert that man is no more disposed for regeneration than a stone or an irrational animal. For there are naturally such faculties in the soul of man as render him a fit subject of regeneration, which are not to be found in stones or brutes. Thus a man can be regenerated, but a brute or a stone cannot. In that sense, Augustine says, the capacity of having faith and love is of the nature of man, but to have them of the grace of believers. Vosius has proved by proper arguments that this is to be understood not of the proximate, but remote capacity, and so far as man has naturally those faculties in which faith and love may be wrought.